Okay. Um, yeah, this is, this is uh, since this is a class, I like to start on time and try to end on time. So welcome everybody to my last lecture of the uh, second module of uh, the Tame Phenomena or the Real Field. Sorry, I have to do it by Zoom, but I'm currently in Columbus. I'll be back um, on the 28th. So um, I'm still available. I'm still available if anybody wants to talk to me, but it'll, you know, you'll have to send me an email or something. Okay, um, I've got a lot of technology here. So let me try to get myself together. So I will be turning off my video to, stay, to save some bandwidth. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm going to be screen sharing. That's good. I'm going to hide this. Okay. So at the moment, I kind of, oh, what happened over here? I kind of can't see anybody, but that's all right. Uh, I'll, I have a slave over here that I'll keep an eye on. I don't want those there. How did those get there? Okay, I, now I think we're getting there. Okay, I think I think everything, I think I'm set up now. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to, today, there, there's going to be a sort of two parts to the lecture today. The, um, I'm not exactly sure how much time there will be for the second part. One of the things, one of the things that I've been emphasizing in the earlier lectures was that there are these nano-minimal uh, structures that have these log spirals in them that I contend are worthy of being called tame and worthy of studying, but I haven't really made any of that precise. So that's mostly what the game is going to be today. And so the, but the, so the first part of the lecture is that I'm going to try to explain the nice features of these things without, um, well, for, for a general participant in the program, I will not be able to prove anything. There are various reasons for that. Um, but one of them is that the main result on which basically almost everything else relies on requires model theory. And I don't mean definability theory. I mean model theory. I mean saturated embedding tests and you know that kind of stuff. So that the second part of the talk will be when I try to give at least a sketch the, the proof of what is arguably the main result about these structures, the main technical result. And uh, so people who don't know model theory, I guess, could either drop off at that point or stick around and see how, uh, what model theorists do when they're, when they're off by themselves or something. Okay. So let's, um, oh, I have to do something here, which I forgot to do. Uh, make sure my chalkboard is reset as far as I can go. I think that's probably about it. Okay. So um, our data here, first, we're just gonna start off with an expansion of the real field. We're gonna quickly uh, put some more conditions on here, yeah, expansion in the sense of definability. And we're gonna fix uh, some uh, uh, not positive real number. Now, purely for convenience, I'm going to introduce some new notation here. We're gonna let G be equal to uh, what I was earlier calling alpha Z, which is the multiplicative group generated by alpha. Okay, so the question here is, um, you know, what can be said about the expansion of R by G 
relative to R. So in other words, if I know enough, of, if I know a bunch of stuff about R, uh, what can I say about this expansion? Oh, and I guess from now on, I, I might screw this up once in a while, but the convention is gonna be, because otherwise I'll, I'll go crazy, uh, definable um, alone, unmodified, will mean um, definable in the expansion. I will also have to talk about definable in R occasionally, things like that, but uh, most of the time I'll be talking about definability in the expansion. All right, so hopefully I won't slip up on that too many, too many times. Now, there's some trivialities that we wanna get rid of here uh, right off the bat. So of course, uh, um, so this is trivial if, uh, if R itself defines uh, G. So let's uh, suppose not. Uh, that certainly means then uh, certainly alpha is not equal to one because that's just the trivial group. And uh, because we have a multiplicative subgroup here, I could take either alpha or one over alpha to be the generator. Uh, so I'm also for convenience going to take alpha bigger than one. Uh, okay, doesn't really matter, but it, it'll help. Okay, now um, I've mentioned this before by Hieronymy. Um, this guy uh, defines um, the integers if it defines an irrational power function. What I mean by that is a, an ordinary real power function with an irrational exponent. All right, well, we've already, I've already, we've talked at length about if you're defining the integers, then, um, well, <laughs> either R defined the integers, in which case nothing's changed, or you went from something that you might have some control over to something that you have no control over. So uh, we certainly don't want this. So we're going to uh, assume that um, R has field of exponents Q. That's the buzzword for this. That's the same thing as saying no definable irrational power functions. Now, let me check and see how everything is looking here. I guess that looks pretty good. Okay. Yes, I'm checking my monitor every now and then to make sure nothing funny is happening. Okay, so um, that's where we are now. So these are just, these are gonna be some assumptions that we're starting with. And so now let's um, recall uh, an imp something that was made, was mentioned in the earlier lectures. So we wanna recall uh, if, if R defines, uh, say, restricted exponentiation uh, and restricted sign. Actually, any non-trivial intervals will do, but these are the sort of traditional ones. So um, then, actually, I suppose we could even say if RG here, That's good enough, but um, then, then what we know is that then, uh, then this S omega, the spiral, this log spiral uh, is uh, definable in the expansion um, with, let's see, omega can be calculated. It's gonna be log of alpha over two pi. Now, bearing in mind that you know the the whole point of the, the the emphasis of this module has been on 
what kind of um, dealing with uh, expansions by definable vector fields of R and so on. Um, we're, and I already gave an argument that said we shouldn't try to even bother with that program unless we started with a no minimal base structure. Okay. So finally, we'll turn the corner and say, now we're going to assume uh, that R is also a minimum. Okay, so we have something here, R is O minimal. We don't need this at the moment. That's where that was, we don't, we, it, now we're not actually gonna care about log spirals so much because we've talked enough about them. We have, but we're gonna have R is O minimal. It has field of exponents Q. We're going to add a cyclic multiplicative group and we're gonna find out what we can say about that. In the case that we also have these guys around, then we have the log spiral and hence uh, one of these structures that I claim is possibly, is basically the only good model for tame control theory that might, uh, that ha that might have a log spiral or even not be O-minimal for that matter. Okay, so there's, uh, we're down to all this now. And I think probably safe for me to start a new page. All right, so I'm going to start now trying to um, I'm going to start trying to talk about the good things. So let's say some good things about um, this expansion. It's going to take a while to explain um, all of these. The proofs are scattered in various places. Some of them are specific. Actually, not very many of them are specific to this particular structure. Some are, but again, these are the ones we're interested in. So um, one of the things is that it turns out to be convenient to not work with the group, but rather with a step function that's interdefinable with the group. So I, I could. it's easier to explain later maybe why that's true, but one, one thing uh, is uh, you can easily check is that, well, the step function that I'm about to write down is definitely not quantifier free relative to what you started with. So if we're gonna try to have any kind of quantifier elimination, uh, this guy is already causing trouble. All right, so here's, um, and I'm not sure I like the notation, but I'm gonna use it for now. So for T and R, real number, we're going to put um, the floor of T with respect to G is going to be, oops, okay. It's kind of like the least integer or the greatest integer function, except now we have to do it on the group. So it's going to be the maximal, it's the greatest thing in G that's less than or equal to T. Uh, if t is bigger than zero. And for various technical reasons, we need this to be totally defined. So it's going to be zero uh, if t is less than or equal to zero. Okay, so this is this, we won't have to use this too often. Um, it, we only need it for a little while. Okay, so I'm going to define some special, uh, a special class of functions now. Now that we all know what this guy is, I'm going to go to a new page. So again, it's you draw the picture. It's 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 like it's just the it's essentially the exponential image, the alpha based exponential image of the greatest integer function on the integers. But then you, in order to make it total, we slam it down to zero on the non-positive elements. But it is, it's a step function, and so it's a little bit nasty to deal with, but uh, we, have to, we have to do this. Okay, so I'm going to define these some guys. Uh, these are going to be uh, collections of n variable definable functions. It's basically inductive. Lo uh, model theorists will recognize, <laughs> will, will recognize pretty quickly what I'm doing 
um, but we don't need to beat that. Um, we don't need to uh, know that yet. So first of all, uh, this, oops, that's not supposed to be there. Let me get some, I just need a, there. So my step function is there in the one variable ones. Um, every function from Rn to R, uh, every definable function, I should have reversed these, every definable function from Rn to R uh, is uh, in Tn. And then finally, we need to be closed under composition. So if I've got something that's in here, and then I've got some data from here, then the composition is in Tn. Okay, so we just build these guys up. So in words, what I'm looking at in words, if we don't, you know, if we just ignore the number of input variables, what I'm saying is that we're looking at, uh, by the way, and these have to be totally definable. These aren't partially definable, totally definable functions. We're basically looking at compositions of functions definable, oh, in R. Uh, yeah, sorry, in R. So as I say, I have to be careful of what, where I'm talking about the definability. Yes, there we go. Okay, so that's right. Every function definable in R is here. So we're, we're just looking at, at finite, uh, you know, at compositions of starting with definable functions in the downstairs structure. Uh, we can compose those, and of course they collapse into another definable function. We can apply this thing to it. We can stuff this thing in and so on. So in words, this, this is what we're getting here. Okay. All right, so we all got, I think we all, I think I got this right. Hopefully we're all there. Again, if you think about it in words, it's a lot easier than writing it down. All right, so here we're gonna get to what's arguably the most important technical result. So I'll even call it a theorem. And it's gonna have two parts. Um, I don't know, A. <laughs> okay, so the first thing here is that every definable subset of Rn is a finite union of sets of uh, the following form. This will be very suggestive. So we have a zero set and then we have a bunch of inequalities. I'll use an L here, I think. And here, of course, the uh, for some L that's a natural number and uh, the F sub I's are all in Tn. Okay, so what am I saying here? Uh, we have quantifier elimination in a certain language. Quantifier elimination for, again, this is, let's just remind ourselves here. Now I really am talking about our G. So uh, definable here, right? So we're gonna be there. So this is, we have quantifier elimination for this structure uh, relative to R if we replace G by the step function that goes along with it. Now, the other thing we get is something about the definable functions. So if F going from Rn to R is definable, again, in the expansion, 
uh, then let's say, okay, so there exists uh, L and N and some guys from TN. Now what else? There's this, there's this. I'm letting this, the existential quantifiers uh, being a little abused here. And also there exists some definable sets uh, in R sub n uh, definable uh, such that uh, for, for I equal, oops. Aha, uh -huh. hang on a second here. Um, in this case, I also want to say, I think that the union is everything because my domain, I didn't really need to, I could have specified this something else, but we'll do it this way. Uh, yeah, I should be careful about that. So they're actually going to cover the domain such that for all I equal one to L, um, F, uh oh, Missed that. Sorry. F restricted to A sub I is equal to F sub I restricted to A sub I. Now, yeah, I know that that's a. Uh, Okay, yeah, that's a bit of a mouthful, but for those who would be familiar with the terminology, now we're just saying that definable functions are given piecewise by terms in a certain language. So, but you have to say, well, what exactly do I mean by piecewise in this case? I mean, finitely piecewise relative to definable sets. Yeah, so I guess I didn't really need to say Rn here, but uh, of course it's okay to do it this way. So, we have quantifier elimination here in a certain language and definable functions are given by piecewise by terms in the same language. So this is the main result about these structures. Now, that's some pretty, that's some pretty decent information, although it's a little annoying that of course the step function has these discount has these infinitely many discontinuities and this breaks things up. Um, so, but we, it, it's, it's an inevitable artifact of the way first order logic works that we have to do this. Because of course, all right, so I, I, can, I can sell the farm a little bit. How on earth would I prove one of these things? Would I prove this? Well, okay, I'd replace G with the step function. They're obviously interdefinable. Um, I'd use the O-minimality of R to just go ahead and assume that its theory is uh, universally axiomatizable and admits quantifier elimination. And then basically I'm going to show then that the extended theory admits quantifier elimination and has universal axiomatization because quantifier elimination and universal axiomatization implies that definable functions are given piecewise by terms. All right, now that's all I'm gonna say about that for now, except, uh, except that I don't know a standard proof of this. I don't know a proof of this that just isn't done in the standard model. I'm sure there must be one, um, but I don't, I, I have certainly never bothered to figure out how to do it because the model theoretic one works. Um, there's a little, challenge problem for anybody who's really interesting, just roll up your sleeves and try to prove this. I don't, I don't think it's all that easy, but I might have some more hints uh, later, uh, further in the lecture on maybe how to do that. Okay, so that's our big result. Um, we, can really, we can really tear apart the definable sets. We can really tear apart the definable functions. The big trouble in here is understanding the big, yeah, is understanding the complications that composing with the step function 
brings in. Okay, but there's um, pretty much, so kind of everything I'm gonna say is gonna follow, well, most of the things I'm gonna say are gonna follow from this. But I'm not gonna, I'm, we're gonna, I'm now gonna move on to like corollaries and applications and so on. These aren't gonna necessarily be in the most logical order. It's more like what's easier to communicate and absorb, okay? So, because this is quite a mouthful or an, or an eyeful or whatever you want to say. Uh, so I want to start, there's certainly an easier way to, this implies a much easier statement that is also very suggestive, but this one is better for technical purposes. So let's get on to a little corollary here. Okay, so, yeah, I think I'll keep going full pages for a little while. So um, here's a, a, a corollary of this. So let's, uh, if X in Rn is definable, uh, then there exists uh, K and N, and there exists some set Z in so some higher dimension here. Ah, so in this, um, okay, good, such that. So Z is definable downstairs. And what we have is that for all X in Rn, uh, X is in my target set. Um, if and only if there exists a K in the Cartesian product of the group, such that uh, XY is in Z. Okay, so what are we what are we really saying here? Um, I get that my definable sets in the expansion show up by taking definable sets downstairs like this, taking the nth card. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Uh, this is something's funny here. Yeah, I think you mean there exists a y and z to the k. Yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, like this I can probably fix. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I got mixed up on my variables here. Right, so now, so you're taking, this is the upstairs dimension, you take a, the Cartesian product of the group, you um, intersect across and then you project down. Now, some of you will, recognize uh, this and may have seen something like this under the name of a special set. And there are a number of results in model theory where you add a new predicate and you wind up getting that uh, things are Boolean combinations of such things. And that's sometimes called near model completeness. But in this case, we don't need Boolean combinations. They are simply very special existential formulas with respect to the expansion. Now, I, this is certainly a lot easier to, to write down and a lot easier to think about. And I think it really starts to help motivate why uh, some of the things are gonna be true that we're gonna be stating. Because really, in a way, what we're doing is we're thinking about, we're starting off with uh, something definable of no minimal structure here. And we're kind of chopping it up or taking slices out of it controlled by this group and projecting them, which kind of amounts to a little bit of a rearranging here and there. So we might expect some things to be true about X. So for example, we might expect that, well, almost everywhere in a sense to be made precise, my X should be locally definable 
in the downstairs structure, in the original home animal structure. Uh, this will turn out to be true. And so the only, what, what happened, however, what happened, where these guys, where these guys approach, where the Y's and the G sub K's approach limit points is where we have problems, right? If I only take a bounded, logarit sorry, logarithmically bounded subset of here, and then start looking at this guy. So there's only going to be finitely many of them. It's going to be a compact set. So we're taking sort of increasing unions of finite sets that we're getting by going through ominimal cells. And then we just have to control what happens in the limit. So it's pretty easy to go from the main result to here. You can also then, well, how do you turn around and go from here to the other one? That, uh, that's, the, that's the problem with this statement. It's nice, it's easy, it's very suggestive, but it actually, it's, it's, it's still like the difference between the implicit function theorem and the inverse function theorem. The implicit function theorem is called that because the functions are implicit, not explicit, and hence hard to work with. So the technical statement from the previous slide is the one we'll really work with, but this is a good one to think about and a way to remember it. Okay, so there's one, there's one thing. You can think of this as a particular type of uh, particularly nice form of model completeness, if you like. Okay, I forgot that I have those lines in the way. Now it comes, the next uh, thing that comes up is this, uh, it's a, I, I always hate to kind of even mention this word, but it has to be done once in a while because you have to call it something. So de-minimality. Um, I invented the word because I, I had to have a word. Some, I had to have something to work with. So uh, this is gonna, we're just going to say it say it this way: If y and r n plus one is definable, um, then there exists an L in N such that for all X in RN, that's about time I introduced some, oh, well, I can get away with it for a little while longer. This following, this set, it's the, the fiber above X, if you will. Um, so this uh, either has interior, right? It's a subset of R. It either has interior uh, or uh, is a union of, I could say at most, but it, I don't have to, L discrete sets. So this, this was my, my, the definition of de-minimality that I came up with for structures. Um, in particular, you can, let's say, what does this mean for the one variable ones? Because it's better to restate this a little way. So um, every unary definable set is a disjoint union. I'm sorry. Of open intervals and finitely many definable discrete sets. By the way, let me just remind everybody what discrete means in this case. It just means that every point is isolated. Um, so G itself, the group G itself is a discrete set and so is the origin, but the union is not discrete anymore. So no, it is not true that unions of discrete sets are discrete. What is true is that unions of closed discrete sets are closed and discrete, but that's a different story. 
So now the interest is, so this, this here obviously uh, is a special case of this with n equals zero. Um, it's actually an open question whether if this is true, if ever you, if it's true for the unary sets, is this version true? That's still an open question. Um, I kind of suspect that it's not true. So again, just uh, for the model theorists here, um, what we can really use is that the quantifier elimination results, the, the technical result means that this, the one variable version, you can show that this holds in every model of the theory. Ah, well, then you get this by compactness, very easy. So, um, so I, as I said, I needed this word uh, because I needed, I, I needed to talk about it when I was writing about something, but I personally don't believe that de-minimality is a very robust notion, and I don't recommend just deciding to willy-nilly to study it in general. You have to be a little bit careful because there's a whole lot, it's very easy to make assumptions about this property that, that aren't true or at least we don't think are true. But it's, it's a good thing to know. And I'm, this, because this is really actually gonna help um, understand something else we're gonna do. See, to me, the thing is, is that, all right, I get, here's a little editorializing. Model theorists, we got spoiled by omenimality. Omenimality should be a definition about, about theories about extensions of, order, of linear orders. And so you should say that a theory is O minimal if every model, if in every model, every unary set uh, is a finite union of open intervals and points. But it, as, it, as, most, as any of the model theorists here probably know, it turns out that uh, your theory is O minimal if and only if any model is O minimal. So the property turns out to be elementary, but that's like huge. Um, and so for me, the right definition of de-minimality is about theories extending linear orders in every model, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and so then you wind up with this one that can be explained without any model theory. Now, okay, so now some good things can be proved just from de-minimality, um, especially if you're over the reals. So I don't wanna suggest that you can't prove any good general theorems, that's not true. But the stuff we want, um, you can't get just from this. We need the stronger, um, the better properties of the quantifier elimination and universal axiomatization results. Okay, so what is the kind of stuff that we can get just from de-minimality? Well, okay, here's one. Uh, Definable choice. Now, this is a phrase that people in omenimality are uh, used to. And so let's go ahead and state this though. So we'll take, oh, well, I'll just keep going. I'm being lazy about hogging the whole board. Uh, so we have a definable set. And uh, okay, give it a name and B, uh, B, uh, the projection of A. On the first M coordinates. So then there's a definable function. Rn, uh, such that um, uh, phi is contained in A. And no, I don't say graph because I'm using set theory as a foundation, not category theory. There is no difference between a function and its graph. Um, there's a definable uh, function that goes, that picks out things through A um, and, and it does it in a, in a really good way. So, um, for all x, y, and b, um, if, okay, I'm gonna use some fiber notation here. If the fiber 
of A above X is equal to the fiber of A above Y, then phi picks the same thing, the same point. All right, so what is this guy in, in case? This would be, this would be the, um, the things in Rn such, uh, who's, such that X comma that thing is in A. So these are fibers, fiber notation. Okay, so um, this means we have, in particular, we have definable skolem functions and elimination of imaginaries. So that's a good thing to have. And this only really needs the, this only needs the de-minimality um, because we're over a field. Now the other, another thing that's true here is, uh, I guess the name, I guess if I have to give it a name, it's the zero set property. And what this says is that uh, if X in Rn is closed and definable, and uh, I take any natural number P, then uh, there is a definable, uh, say F and CP RN to R totally defined, uh, such that X is equal to the zero set of F, oops. Sorry, I'm getting, getting a little sloppy here. Running down to the bottom of the page. Oh. I would so much be rather be standing in front of you doing this on a chalkboard, but, but okay, that's the way we are. So um, people who uh, work with, who do real analytic geometry of O-minimal structures will recognize this as one of the um, properties that uh, holds for these so-called geometric categories. Definable choice is another nice one. Uh, I should say this is by, uh, this is actually um, uh, me and, uh, all right, I'll, I'll write it out, out of Pat. See, I can do it. There. This is not as easy. This is not just a straightforward general. This is not a straightforward modification of the thing in the O minimal case. You really do have to do some, it, it's, it's, it's more difficult. Uh, this, is, this has already been published. It's in PAMS. And um, I think I, I gave a link to it on, on my resource page so you don't have to go chase it down anywhere. Uh, it's an interesting paper. Okay, so now, by the way, um, uh, before somebody asks, does it hold with n equal infinity? Not when you're over a polynomially bounded O minimal structure. No, it only holds for the finite p's. But that's all. That's all. Generally, what's needed for you don't really need the c infinity version of this. Generally, all you need to know is that you can take arbitrarily high finite differentiability uh, in order to do certain arguments. Okay, so there's another nice thing, two nice things. And those follow just from the de-minimality. All right, now let's talk about some things that aren't so good. But they're not, it's not, it's not completely horrible. So, um, Right, so the so-called frontier property fails. I'll say, well, I'll explain this. Um, so in O minimal structures, we know that uh, if we have a non-empty set, then the naive dimension, just the, the dimension of the frontier is less than the dimension of the set. 
This means that we can always start with a definable set and take the points of highest dimension, throw them away, then we know that drops, you go to the points of the next highest dimension, and you can decompose things this way. But of course, obviously, uh, this certainly fails in, 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 our, in our thing because, um, well, if we look at the frontier of our group, it's the origin. Right? I mean, these are all the integer powers of alpha. So they go march down to zero. So, and of course, uh, the dimension of G itself is zero because uh, they're all isolated points. And so here's a case where the frontier does not drop. However, and uh, something here, this doesn't necessarily use everything about the group, but this is a special result um, as far as we know that we're, we're not quite sure how far this can be extended yet. Um, but something good from uh, Tukanovich, one of my former students. This is in his thesis though, it was never published anywhere. So um, uh, if, uh, if I take a non-empty, just to be non-empty, non-empty, to be safe, if this in Rn is a definable, uh, say C1 submanifold, uh, and here manifolds are not required to be connected. Um, then something really, not really, uh, this is, I think is really, really nice. Then the dimension of the frontier drops. It drops um, if and only if the, um, the dim X dimensional surface measure of, of X is finite, right? So, you know, what's going on there? Um, that cannot be true. Hmm? Uh, Sorry? Uh, well, what if X is the whole real line, for example, then the frontier would be empty. Uh, ah, right, okay. So I've, I've obviously forgotten something over here. Let's just go ahead and then say, um, right, let's say bounded. Yeah, there's, um, I can't remember what I'm missing here at the moment, but you're right. Uh, it can't just be, it can't just be unbounded like that. Um, I have to, I'd have to go back and see it. With bounded, I think it'll work. That's probably what I'm missing here. I haven't looked at his thesis in a while. Thank you. Yeah, it must be that. Okay. Um, so this is a really nice thing. So you can detect uh, when uh, you can detect if you these these things can be detected. It means that you can go through and detect when the d-dimensional surface measure of something is finite by a first-order condition, and so you can look through parameterized families and see things. But this is the closest thing we know to having a frontier property for uh, these structures because. Uh, if you're D minimal and not O minimal, then certainly the frontier property fails. Now we think that this good thing, we think this might hold in some other settings, but um, some of that stuff is still being checked. Um, Michael decided to not continue in research and the project kind of dropped there and we need somebody else to pick it up. So more to come on that, I hope. 
Um, the last thing I could, the, la the last sort of a bad thing, and then we'll take a short break, is that and it's easier for me to just say this in words than to write it all out. Connected components of definable sets are not necessarily definable, even if there's only finitely many connected com components. Because, um, uh, and the same statement is true for path components. Now we know in, in O minimal structures, even in an abstract sense, um, every definable set is a finite union of definably connected components, which over the reals just means every definable set has finitely many connected components, each of which are definable. Um, that's not true in our RG, but uh, it's not, as obvious to show as you might think. Remember, to show that something's not definable, you have to really say no, no possible formula can work. Um, uh, find a uh, definable set with concrete. Find an actual concrete definable set with a uh, connected component that's not definable. So yeah, you you look at it, you think, well, sure, that 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 seems that seems reasonable. But on the other hand, when you actually try to get your hands on one, it's not as easy as you might think. So um, there's a little challenge problem for people. Um, this should be find a definable set in, in our particular structure, R sub G, uh, with a connected component uh, that, what is this? Oh, that was an apostrophe, I guess, that is not connected. Um, uh, a good place to start is just forget the abstract setting and just look at the real field of um, expanded by a group and, and see if you can find one there. Okay, uh, I, need, I need to take a five minute break to rejuvenate my voice and so on. So let's go ahead and we'll stop recording for five minutes and then I'll be back. I decided to turn my video on for a minute to say hi and um, give everybody a chance to wander back, finish their cigarettes or drinks or whatever. And uh, I'll, I'll get restarted, <clears throat> but I will say I'm, uh, I, I, hear that, I hear that things continue to in, open up and improve up there. And so I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to coming back and getting some non-Zoom mathematics done. So, I'll, I'll see you all uh, soon. All right, so let's uh, do that again. Okay, so yeah, um, now as, as Lau uh, pointed out, yes, of course, the counterexample is bad. This does need to be bounded here the way I've said it. Uh, what happened is that I, I was also playing around with the idea is that, well, if you're unbounded, then there's certainly a nice way to there's a nice canonical way to turn it into a bounded C1 submanifold and still be definable. And then you could apply the result there and then get some asymptotic estimates by analyzing once you blow it back up again. So uh, that was something I was thinking about, but that wasn't Michael's result. Michael's result was definitely about bounded C1 submanifolds. Okay, so now part uh, the, the, the part two here is, is it, I haven't quite finished saying, um, yeah, I haven't, uh oh, hang on. So what's going on here? Drag that. Oh, sorry, I'm, hang on. I'm, I'm dealing with some um, Zoom strangeness. So hide this. And then hide this. Okay. I have a few more things I want to talk about that don't require model theory um, that that you know are, are suggestive, and these are the kinds of things that are 
that are actually important and where my, this is where we need real stuff, not just abstract demonology junk. Michael's result here needed to know specific things about the structure that we were in. We don't know that this, that, uh, I have no reason to believe that this is, that this is true in arbitrary demonal structures. For example, I mean, maybe it is, but I have no reason to believe it's true. So let's um, talk um, about some other things here. And I'm gonna, in order, I'm gonna have to talk a little bit loosely because if I try to write everything down really carefully, it'll eat up all the time. But so, um, you know, one of the things we know, we've got these say, we've got, we've got some uh, A and R definable. And what we've learned is that because of this de-minimality thing, well, there's a natural decomposition of A into um, say CP submanifolds. It's not all that interesting in this case, but let's just look what we do. Well, the interior of A is obviously a one-dimensional C1 submanifold. It's even an analytic submanifold because it's an open set. It's dimension one. So that's a definable set. And so there's, uh, the, the, so in other words, the, if you were to say the one dimensional points, the smooth, the one dimension, the smooth points of highest dimension would be the interior of A if, if it's not empty. Okay, so well, now those are pretty, we understand those pretty well. So we'll go ahead and throw that away. And now we can say that, you know, we're, Think, going to think of A and throw away its interior. Well, so now what do we have? We know that there's, uh, by the de-minimality, that whatever this thing is, it has to be a finite union of discrete sets. Now, thanks to, uh, okay, so, yeah, I don't want to get too sidetracked on that. Now, what happens here? So, so let's just uh, assume that that a had that the interior of a is empty. Let's assume that, and then so now we'll start looking at say the isolated points of a. Now that's a definable set. It's a zero dimensional submanifold. Again, it's even a zero dimensional analytic submanifold. So the isolated points of A uh, are now, so, the, so now the smooth points of highest dimension, the C1 or CP or whatever we wanna do, the smooth points of highest dimension are gonna be the isolated points. Okay, so we throw those away. Now the problem is the dimension doesn't necessarily drop. Um, that's, we've already seen that if we look at G, it's the closure of G, G, G union zero, the isolated points here are the group, but then the dimension didn't drop when I threw away these guys. Now, however, by the de-minimality, and uh, let's just say it's an amusing exercise in basic topology to show that if you have a topological space, that's a finite union of discrete sets. Then the Cantor Bennigsen rank of that space is also finite and should be easily computable from the number of, <laughs> more or less from the number of discrete sets that were involved. Uh, there's a little challenge for you. As one of my colleagues, uh, uh, now retired Jerry Edgar, once put it, this is the kind of stuff that every undergraduate student of Hausdorff probably did his homework, but no one knows how to do anymore. So yeah, there's something for you to think about. But anyway, it does stop. So then we have the isolated points, we throw those away, we do it again, we throw them away, and we wind up decomposing A into finitely many nice, uh, say, CP submanifolds in a nice canonical fashion. Now, what, what, what's, what's nice, what's good is that um, something like this also happens in higher, in, in arbitrarily, in, in all dimensions. So now if we just take A and RN definable, then the same kind of thing is going to work, but it take, this was easy. <laughs> this was very easy. Uh, this is not so easy, but you could sort of do the same thing. Once again, the interior of A, if it's not empty, there's the smooth points of highest dimension. Fine, assume that A does not have interior. It has a dimension though, and we look for the smooth points of highest dimension. That will be 
again, uh, a CP submanifold. Uh, smooth, the, the, if I say CP smooth points, then the manifold is going to be CP. Now, you would think it would become utterly obvious that um, from this D minimality assumption that that would actually have to stop too at some point. You would take away the smooth points, take away the smooth points, and so on, and this would have to stop. And then you go, and then the dimension would drop, and you go on to the next one, and you get a nice canonical decomposition of A into definable submanifolds. Now, in fact, this does work, but it's a lot trickier than it looks. And if all you do is try to use the assumption of D minimality, this is definitely a bit tricky. I made a mistake in my original paper on this that was noticed by Anton Giulio Fornicero. Um, in one of my proofs, I, uh, I, I unwittingly applied the bare category theorem to an uncountable collection of sets and wound up with a phony proof of something. But anyway, it has been fixed, but in, in our special case, uh, what is going on with this guy? See, there was this problem, there was a theorem, there was a gap in it, eventually it was uh, fixed by um, Tamron, Tamron Tanulak. But we don't have to worry about that because we're in here and, and we have our special thing, we have our this specialized quantifier elimination in here and we also know things about indefinable functions. So, with, you don't have to go through this abstract repair of a proof in order to show that this, this idea of decomposing, say, a unary definable set into finitely many submanifolds, um, this works for all definable sets in any number of variables. Okay, so I don't want to, you know, say anything more about that too much, but we could just call it, I guess, a manifold decomposition or something, or a CP decomposition. Or maybe I shouldn't use decomposition. Ah, I guess it's all right. I'm going to have to reuse that differently. We have something like this, and this will be true for all definable sets. So that's great. That's a nice thing to know. So, but... There's something even more um, useful that will hold. And for this, I'm going to have to do, um, I'll try to, uh, I'll have to do, give some sort of definitions here. So, so my original structure R, that's O minimal. And um, so I want to talk about a, let's say, uh, a countable uh, R decomposition of Rn. Okay, well, we all know in the O minimal case, countable here would be finite, right? This would be, say, C1, we'd have C1 cell decomposition theorem. I'm going to, I'm simply going to define what I mean by a countable our decomposition of Rn in, in a fairly obvious way. So we have to do this inductively. So um, uh, in R, first of all, it's just a uh, partition of R into, say, let's say, countably many points and open intervals. Now, of course, points and open intervals are cells in my in my downstairs structure, but you know, so I could have said partition of R into countably many R cells, cells definable in R. Now, so uh, so in Rn plus one, well, we do the usual thing. We have to say it's a it's it's, it's just like ordinary cell decomposition, except you allow countable. Yeah. Part I'm having I'm having a little fade here. Okay, so it should be a uh, partition of Rn plus one into 
unaccountably many R cells, so cells definable in R, uh, such that I give, oh, I need a name, um, P, say, of R and doing unaccountably R cells such that the projection is um, accountable R decomp of Rn. OK, so this is exactly the only difference here between the usual definition of a cell decomposition is that uh, I've replaced finite with countable. Now, of course, all right. Um, it's just a definition. Definitions are neither true nor false. They're either useful or not. Well, OK, so in this case, it turns out it is useful. And this is the kind of stuff where abstract deminimality fails to go anywhere as far as I know. So because what's going to be true in our structure is that so um, Let's say if A is a finite collection of sets, of definable sets in Rn, uh, then there is a countable Decomp R decomposition of Rn that is compatible with A. Now remember, okay, so here the definable means definable in the expansion by G. And so what we get in compatible, remember that just means that uh, given any set capital A and A, um, the, the cells, every cell is either contained in A or is disjoint from A, I guess the way to say it. So the picture here is, well, Naively, it's it's exactly what it's it's like cell decompositions in the original luminal structure, except now you have more complicated behavior showing up. You're allowing countably many of them, of course. And then also you have things like limit points, you know, like our the classic example in in one dimension of the closure of G. So now it should be pretty it should be one should be pretty clear from this that that if you think about it this does mean that sets definable in in the expansion are going to be almost everywhere locally definable in my original minimal structure the only inter the interesting stuff happens is where is where things might glue together and you do have those kinds of things and when you combine this, um, you combine this with what I was calling uh, uh, the manifold uh, decomposition. And you get um, you get a you get a pretty striking picture of the analytic geometry going on. And lo the local stuff is mostly just the same as being in the O minimal case. And what needs to be figured out is how things fit together. I can't, I don't want to try to make that any more precise right now, but um, this is the kind of thing that as far as I know, there's no reason to believe that, that this kind of junk holds for arbitrary deminimal structures. Even if you do have a countable cell decomposition theorem, you don't know anything about whether the cells are O-minimal or not, um, or whether they can be taken to be O-minimal or not. So, but 
so th this is a, when you when you you look at these things together and really think about the picture that's coming out of that as it says that we're, we're staying very close you know yes so we've got things like logarithmic spirals maybe showing up but where are the logarithmic spirals not just you know, globally sub-analytic or something. Well, it's only at the origin and it's only at infinity. Other, every, if you look at any sort of logarithmically bounded subset of the spiral, well, it's fine. It's a compact, it's a compact trajectory and uh, there's no problem there. So I think that's, that's about all I can say about the good stuff. Um, but I, I hope, I hope that I, more or less motivated Pete. I, I hope that I've at least made plausible the argument that that these kinds of structures are in fact tame enough where you could go in there and really do some analytic geometry and control theory. And that ultimately that that's what I'm interested in, uh, at least for the purposes of this course. Okay. I mean, are there any questions with anything? Uh, about anything? Just, uh, um, maybe I have a question about this last result. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, is this true for uh, the for the uh, expansion r comma g, or more generally for d minimal? Um, oh, minimal. Uh, sorry, d minimal expansions. What we know about arbitrary de minimal ones over the reals, we don't yes. know this, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. over the reals, there is a countable cell decomposition theorem, but oh. you don't know, but, um, you know, so, so you start drawing these pictures, and so how do you define, say, the first, uh, say you're doing this in the plane, and how do you define the first non-open cell that shows up above an open cell. Well, okay, you could say, all right, this function is defined by saying, I'm the first, I'm the minimal thing in the fiber. I'm the first thing in, above, above zero in the fiber. And then the second definable set, I'm the second thing that's definable up there. So a priori, you need a different formula to define every single cell, every single formula. What, what, what is going on actually in order Part of why uh, something is special here is happening also that I haven't tried to put in words is that the, the cells show up as being somewhat defined uniformly in parameters. So it's not that you just have these countable collections of cells that have nothing to do with each other. They, they're you, you can further decompose things so that, so that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they belong to a single definable family? Yeah, yes, yes. They belong to single definable families. There's like a definable homotopy of the strip. And then you, you stick parameters in and then you get these, uh, you get this, you get the not the non-open cells above it. It's a little bit hard to state. Uh -huh. um, okay. Oh, by the way, thanks. Thanks for speaking up because you reminded me of something. Um, the, the, uh, the proof of this result is actually just a, a minor tweak of, of Lau's result about adding uh, two to the Z to the field of reals. Um, he, he, I, I can't remember. I think that was uh, 88 or something, mid 80s, late 80s, something. And all I did was look at the proof and tear it apart with some modern technology and just realized all I really needed was um, polynomially bounded O minimal and you can get this really nice stuff. So model theoretically, the proof was really, really goes back to um, Lau's paper. And um, it, it's, it's a paper that's well worth reading in my opinion. So no, here in fact, but uh, but for the as for the abstract deminimality, here's something I don't even know. So suppose you have a deminimal expansion of the field of reals. Um, you take a definable set. Is there a countable cell decomposition of it, where all of the cells 
live together in a no minimal structure. For that matter, do any of the cells live in a no minimal structure? Or, well, no, then no, so some of them certainly will because they'll be ridiculous. Um, the, the connect, uh, there's no, I, 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 uh, I don't, I just don't think this is a robust con notion. I mean, if it was, people would have been able to prove things by now. I, and I don't, I don't, the, just in the abstract setting, there's, you can say there's this thing called accountable decomposition, but now the cells have to just come from the structure and a consideration, not some old minimal thing. You get this abstract thing and, you, you know, all you know is that you have ways of defining each individual cell but you have you don't know if the cells are well behaved or not so it's it's um it's it's i mean fair warning to anybody who thinks they want to you know study arbitrary deminimal structures there's a lot of obstructions there but but i mean hey um if somebody can get somewhere with this uh, more power to them but i think there's some real serious problems with that level of generality especially if you're not over the reals so it's not really model theory per se. So any other, <laughs> sorry to be so negative, but uh, yeah, that, that my experience is that you, you can only go, with the analytic geometry, you could get some places. Um, like the CP zero set thing only requires the minimality. The definable choice only requires the minimality. But for any real fine, for any, for the kind of information that you'd really want in order to be doing anything sort of control theory kind of stuff, um, I, I, I just don't see that there's enough good information there. Well, I only have, I only have a few minutes left to try to talk now to the model theorists about, um, about this proof, I'd like to, you know, kind of at least say something uh, about how it works. It's gonna, but it's gonna have to be pretty sparse because I'm supposed to quit in eight minutes. So we're gonna move on now to at least trying to talk a little bit about, whoa, oh yeah, that's right. So I ran out of room. Uh, I have to do, do it, <laughs> go up here. So let's go back. Uh, okay, we're gonna start talking some model theory now. Okay, so we got this guy here. We wanna understand this. We're assuming, remember, so R is minimal. We say, okay, we understand that pretty well. Now, actually, this is obviously interdefinable with, um, with the step function that I defined. So these guys are interdefinable. And it's actually turns out to be much more convenient to work this way. I'm also going to make, uh, just for temporary convenience only, I'm going to assume that uh, my alpha is uh, zero definable downstairs. This, this, this is purely for so that I can try to talk about the important parts of the proof. So we're going to assume that, um, I should say assume, assume alpha is zero definable downstairs. All right, now, so since R is O minimal, we know by, we know we have definable scolum functions and all this, so um, without loss of generality, we can assume that the language of R, L, why do I keep doing this? Keeps doing this to me. The language of R, so this would be the language of R, um, has no relation symbols except less than. We'll replace any of the other ones with, um, you know, uh, uh, characteristic functions. And what else? Um, that the theory of R um, has. QE and a universal axiomatization. Okay, 
So now why is that again? That's because we have definable stolen functions. So one of the things, once you have QE and universal axialization here, uh, you know, let's see, what is it that substructures of models are elementary substructures? Now that makes doing a saturated embedding test on this a little bit easier. But, but another thing that's important now is that um, this guy also, this has a universal axiomatization. Well, actually, and what is it? In fact, how is this thing axiomat, how is this axiomatized relative to R? There's some obvious stuff that has to be there. G has to be a multiplicative subgroup of positive elements. Um, alpha needs to be its least positive element, or sorry, its least element bigger than one. Um, and um, then another important thing there is that every, in any, there's an axiom, you have to write down an axiom that says that if I'm bigger than zero, then there exists a G in G such that I have something like this, right? So for all X greater than zero, there is a G in G such that this is true. Now, once I put my uh, step function in there, this becomes, this becomes universal. This at the moment, of course, is not universal. This guy allows this to be a universal axiom. And so actually what I should say here is that this thing potentially has a universal axiomization. The amazing thing is to, I mean, or at least a very nice thing is that once you switch to this guy, the most obvious axiom is a, if you just write down the axioms that you're absolutely forced to have, that I'm a multiplicative subgroup. You have something like this, and you know there's nothing living in between one and alpha. That's all you need. That's it. The only extra information that shows up is that. Now, of course, in order to do this, we have to do uh, we have to prove it. How do we do that? We uh, start with this guy, um, together with the obvious axioms. the ones we obviously need meaning, and we wanna show it's complete. And, oh, oh, what's going on here? Uh, hang on here, something, okay. That has something to do with this weird pen I use. So we wanna show it's complete. So we are gonna play the usual game. Um, now remember, uh, we're we're going to show that it's uh, we want to show that it's at least model complete and that it has an algebraically prime model. In fact, we're just going to show outright that it has quantifier elimination, and getting uh, and then we even then all we need to do is show that um, uh, a certain you know that there's this particular structure that embeds in every model, and that's pretty easy to find because R has a prime model and G has to live in it. So um, that's the game. So this boils down, all of this stuff boils down to showing, to showing that this, our candidate theory here, this, the original one together with some, with these axioms boils down to showing that this has QE in its language. And it's, um, I do it via saturated embedding test. And it's fairly straightforward once you have uh, some key tools. And that's, I can't get too much more into it, but we'll say the key tools or the points are um, we, um, value groups, Uh, 
of models uh, and uh, Lau's uh, so-called uh, Wilkie inequality. Uh, this is uh, due to van injuries. Now, if we want at some point, we can, we can actually do a little seminar, a little workshop for people who really want to see the guts of this thing. We can just do that in one of the seminar rooms when I'm back. Um, it's, it's a nice argument. Uh, and, um, you know, th this, this, I, the only way I knew that this result was going to be true is because I knew I could, I knew I could do this using model theory via saturated embedding test which frankly, I'm not crazy about because I know I lose information sometimes when I do that. But well, look, you know, uh, what was I supposed to do? Pretend I didn't know it? So anyway, um, I, always, I always find these things amusing when, when I, it's amusing when you only know how to prove things using model theory, yet what your primary result is applied to a standard model of some sort. <coughs> Okay, so that's my, I'm going to have to end there because I'm already a minute over. But um, again, if anybody's interested in this, we, we can do a little, uh, we can do a, a little working seminar or something and see the actual proof of this for anybody who's interested. But you would have to know first semester graduate model theory, I would say, in order to understand what we're going to do. I can't do a tutorial on model theory. All right, well, uh, thanks a lot to everybody. I'm gonna, let me go ahead and um, start my video again so I can seem, there I am. So um, what else can I do? I can stop the share and kill this thing. And I can ask if anybody has any questions or comments. Nice example of the value of model theory. Okay, well, uh, we, we don't need to agonize over questions now anyway. As I said, I'll be back on the 28th. I can even, if push comes to shove, I could answer things by email or, or Zoom in the meanwhile. But uh, for now, we'll leave it at that. And let me know in the future if you want to know any more details of this stuff.